week, we have as a speaker someone from the Center for Korean Studies. Um, Jack got his PhD at UCLA, uh, was a postdoc with the center, and is currently a lecturer with the center, and is an archaeologist, obviously, who is going to be talking to us about mortuary ritual in Iron Age Korea, which is a topic of, I think, substantial crossover interest. So, thanks. So, as Rosemary said, um, my affiliation here is with the Center for Korean Studies. So since I've been here, I've been mainly pitching my research at Korean historians, Koreanists, people uh, trying to convey the significance of archaeology to um, people who are already interested in Korea. So this is um, a really great opportunity, and I'm very thankful for you all, all of you for actually showing up for me to justify my existence to a bunch of archaeologists for once. So. Uh, I'm very uh, excited to hear what you have to say, what questions you have. So why should a bunch of archaeologists care about the Korean Iron Age and mortuary ritual in this period? Well, this is really a pretty significant period of social development on the Korean Peninsula. It's the span of time when we have the formation of the first complex polities or state level uh, societies on the peninsula. And all this seems to happen in a, quite a restricted period of time about the third or fourth century, or beginning in the second century and ending in the uh, fourth century with the uh, development of the first historical kingdoms on the peninsula. And it comes along with a host of other very significant social changes. We've got the emergence of a very visible elite class, a very complex web of competing regional groups, intensified contact with the Han Chinese Empire via its administrative commanderies on the uh, northern portion of Korea and in Manchuria. And with this greater Chinese influence, we have the development of new technologies, iron production, stoneware, ceramics, uh, very broad reaching production and trading networks that encompass the entirety of the peninsula and also southwestern Japan. And although towards the end of this period in the fourth and fifth centuries, we have the development of coherent political entities, um, the first historical kingdoms of Pekje, Silla, and then a number of smaller kingdoms known as Gaia on the southern tip of Korea. Um, there's a real striking amount of diversity in the Iron Age, this period just prior to these state level societies. Um, there's a huge variety in the way different regions and communities mediated contact with China, different strategies of elite legitimization. So the peninsula in the Iron Age is really a great archaeological laboratory for studying state formation or secondary state formation. So anyone interested in that topic should definitely be paying attention to Korea, I think. But the Iron Age is also critical to modern Korean conceptions of identity and political legitimacy. And it's really been a key component in the nation building enterprise that especially South Korea has been engaging in since the end of the Korean War in 1953. Uh, the Iron Age is really the bedrock on which much of Korean history is written. And in fact, the name of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, Daehan Minguk or just Hanguk is literally the country of the Han, Han referring directly to these Iron Age cultures that developed um, in, the, in the third century AD. Uh, so for these re reasons, the Iron Age has really become a focus of archeological research um, and ancient historical research, but it really has resisted easy classification. And there's very little agreement on some very fundamental topics like um, uh, social structure, political um, stratification, cultural contacts, all these kinds of things. So today I'm just basically going to introduce the material culture with a focus on the mortuary remains, which is pretty much all we have for most of this period. And um, then focus on a few areas of concern, especially to Korean archeologists. Um, yeah, um, the reconstruction of social structure, political authority, and ethnic affiliation. And then introduce some new ways of looking at the mortuary data that I think sort of can comment on this or throw this into question. So this is the area we're looking at. This is Korea. I am going to be, oh, my notes got very dark all of a sudden. Um, that's fine, I'm all right. Uh, so I'm gonna be focusing not just on Korea, but also specifically Southeast. Oh, there we go. Ah, quality. <laughs> I'll be all right. Okay. You'll just see me squinting for a little bit. Um, <laughs> 
you really should. You're, you're being kind enough to actually come and talk to all of us. We should make it so that you can Take five, everyone. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Perfect. I want to point out that the most senior people in the department are really corporate and all the board. Um, I'm, I'm humbled by this treatment. I'm getting. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, again, this is the area I'm focusing on, not just the Korean Peninsula, but within that, the southeastern portion of the peninsula. And this is a region collectively known as Yongnam or Gyeongsang. And it is defined very sharply by two mountain ranges. In the east, we have the southern tip of the Tebek Mountains, which form a very sheer uh, eastern coastline. And then the Sobek Mountain Range, which delineates Yongnam from the rest of the peninsula, forms quite a significant mountainous barrier between um, it and the rest of Korea. Uh, in the interior, there's one very significant um, river system, the Nakdong River and its tributaries. And so this has led to um, generally rocky terrain with a few isolated pockets of uh, flat alluvial plains that we see a lot of archaeological activity in. And this is also where the population concentrates in modern times, too. And so for the purposes of the Iron Age, the relevant areas are two inland regions, Taegu Gyeongsan and Gyeongju in the north, and then two coastal areas, Kimhae and Pusan in the south, and Ulsan uh, on the east. And I'll be introducing the material culture from all these regions, but I'm also going to be focusing again, even more specifically, on Gyeongju, the Gyeongju Plain. Um, yeah, this has been the area of the most archaeological activity uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. The Gyeongju Plain is the supposed heartland of the Shilla Kingdom, probably the most significant historical polity that comes out of the Iron Age and eventually goes on in the 7th century to unite defeat the other kingdoms in the region and unite the entire peninsula under one political framework. So it's been quite important for archaeologists for that reason. You can see from the, the picture, it's, there's quite a stark contrast between the flat uh, river valley and the more mountainous terrain that surrounds it. And we have a, a large central plain, the Gyeongju plain, and then a number of more isolated river valleys. And in each of these isolated river valleys, we ha have one, at least one major cemetery site. I'm going to be looking at the entire span of the Iron Age, which encompasses two archaeological subdivisions in Korea, the Early Iron Age and the Proto Three Kingdoms period. The Early Iron Age starts at 300 BC, goes to about 100 BC or 50 BC, depending on which uh, diagnostic artifacts you prefer. And then in the Proto Three Kingdoms period from about 50 BC to 300 AD, this process of state formation and social change really accelerates and we see a corresponding uh, shift in the archaeological data. And here's a few of the major sites from uh, a few of the uh, isolated river valley regions. And so before I jump into actually talking about the archaeology, I think it's worth pausing and discussing a little bit about the practice of archaeology in South Korea. Um, I think this chart really illustrates quite nicely, first, the rapid expansion in archaeological activity in the last uh, um, 10 or 15 years or so, and also just how dominated archaeology is by salvage or rescue projects. The vast majority of digs are of this kind, and every year there's a few um, academic excavations sponsored by universities, and then a number of government reconstruction projects for uh, designed for educational or tourism purposes. But yeah, the vast majority of what we have is from salvage or rescue archaeology. So our sample is very biased in favor of urbanized and developed areas in modern times, and until the 1990s, the focus was really on highly visible or easily excavatable mortuary sites. These projects are chronically underfunded, as you might expect. They're quite rushed, and as a result, many basic field practices often don't get carried out. Um, the first dig I worked on didn't do any sort of flotation or even simple sifting of excavated soil, and so a lot of smaller artifacts just are never recovered, and it's extremely rare that we recover organic remains of any kind, especially in Gyeongju. So although I'm talking about tombs and cemeteries, I've got no nice pictures of skeletons or um, coffin structures or anything like that. 
It's mainly just grave goods. And then the bare outline of a coffin. Here's a example of a fairly typical urban salvage project, open plan, um, excavation undertaken in preparation for the residential development of this area. Um, yeah, so this project and most projects in particular are, are dictated by the needs of construction companies rather than um, any sort of intellectual engagement with the archaeology. And it's very, very rare that we get to uncover an entire site or even become aware of the full extent of any um, sort of zone of human occupation. Although when you're digging in areas like this, it is trivial to get free Wi-Fi on your phone from unsecured hotspots of people living nearby. Um, yeah. So this limits naturally the sample of archaeology we have, but also um, my research in particular, there's, it's very unlikely that I'll ever have a nice site of my own to excavate. I'm limited to working, joining these projects myself and also collecting published uh, excavation report uh, data. So with all that in mind, let's look at the archaeology itself, beginning in the early Iron Age, so about 300 BC to uh, the first century, 300 BC to 100 BC. So in the Bronze Age period, just prior to this, we had seen society coalescing, the population co coalescing a bit more. We have large towns that are concentrated on low hillsides that are fortified, um, quite large urban or sort of urban populations. But in the early Iron Age, we don't find any sites like this. We have a very small number of villages made up of uh, clusters of very simple sub semi-subterranean pit houses. And the artifacts mainly recovered from these sites in salvage projects are these ubiquitous, um, simple earthenware vessels with a prominent attached pottery rim. Much more common in the early Iron Age is the recovery of mortuary, um, uh, mortuary sites. Um, tomb clusters have been found in quite an abundance. Some of these are seem connected to or very close to habitation sites. They seem to be largely unplanned grave clusters, usually made up of wood coffin tombs, although some stone cyst tombs from the prior Bronze Age also survive. And even though we're talking about the Iron Age now, at least in this very early period, the most common metal artifacts in tombs are bronze, very nicely cra uh, well-crafted um, um, Slim bronze daggers, spears, uh, dagger axes, and a wide array of these bells or rattles that you see on the right side of these pictures. And metal in general is still quite a rare grave good, and usually they're um, taken as indicators of um, elite status, prestige goods, and perhaps even a sort of shamanic political uh, leadership role or leadership structure. Uh, any iron we do find are Warring States or Han Chinese finished objects. And uh, there may have been limited smelting or um, reworking of iron on the peninsula, but we, we can't really say for sure yet. In addition to these attached rim pots, we also have a more specialized mortuary ceramic set much smaller, more delicate uh, red vessels or black burnished um, high-necked jars. As we move on into the Proto Three Kingdoms period, settlements become much larger. These are quite sprawling, decentralized areas of human occupation. They sort of encompass agricultural production, iron ceramic production, habitation areas, and of course cemetery areas. Uh, these are really patchworks of many different activities that seem to have developed organically over quite a long period of time. Both these sites were occupied for at least uh, 300 years uh, continuously. Yeah, so uh, this is a pretty well-known site of Indang in the uh, Tegu Gyeongsan region. All the blue shaded areas you see are cemetery sites and they're completely surrounded by um, 
dwellings, by production facilities, and then eventually a uh, earthen rampart and other sort of defensive features. Huang Songdong, the site I showed a little bit earlier, seems to have started out as a small village in this area with an attached cemetery that grew over time to encompass production areas and then a much larger cemetery, and presumably a larger village too that was not recovered in the uh, salvage project. We have the continuation of the coffin tomb tradition, but bronze really declines. And instead, we have the um, adoption and rapid spread of Han Chinese style iron production. Uh, forging and casting was taking place of agricultural and craft tools, and also a limited number of knives, swords, blades, uh, spear blades especially. Instead of these bronze rattles, we have elaborately decorated daggers and Han Chinese luxury goods, such as these uh, bronze mirrors on the right there. Ceramics change as well, probably under the influence of this iron technology that was coming from China. New high-fired uh, wheel-made pottery known as wajil, has quite thick pottery with a tile-like consistency, is produced in a fairly coherent mortuary set in tombs. Usually we find at least one of these uh, fan-necked, horn-handled jars, a smaller hourglass sort of vessel, and then a simple uh, attached rim pot as well. Some sites also have, in addition to coffin tombs, jar burials for sub-adults, cremated remains of infants and children that do not usually contain any sort of um, grave goods, but they are located um, with, they're usually associated with particular coffin tombs. So one interesting aspect of tombs in this period, at least I think, is that um, we have fairly consistent types of objects throughout the entire region, but certain um, very rare objects like uh, bronze mirrors uh, appear in a very, they appear in a very limited number of tombs, but they seem to have been used in a, a really diverse, uh, uh, the way they were used in rituals was quite diverse from site to site, from region to region. And so we have a site like Kyodong in the south, where the, two, where the mirror was found in sort of a cache of other iron and ceramic objects, sort of similar to the way you might find them in a uh, Han Lulang tomb in northern Korea. But we also have mirrors that are found placed inside the coffin underneath the head of the deceased, sort of an imitation of um, a much older Bronze Age custom. And then we also have tombs in the far south where uh, genuine Han mirrors and then imitation, domestic, pr domestically produced imitations, or in some cases, uh, imitations produced in Japan are found sort of arrayed around the corpse or perhaps sewn onto clothing. Some groups did incorporate mirrors into their rituals, but they don't seem to have cared about the objects themselves, but they were more um, um, concerned with the reflective properties of the material itself or refashioning broken fragments into uh, pendants, necklaces, uh, things like that. Here we have four very carefully small circular punch-outs of uh, larger intact mirrors that seem to have been worn as earrings and in some cases fitted reflective side out into uh, pommels of swords and daggers. So, the objects themselves aren't important, it's the metal and its reflective properties that seem to be important to some groups. Other groups are actively incorporating them as whole mirrors in rituals. As we go on to the first and second centuries, into the Proto Three Kingdoms period, we have quite a fundamental shift in mortuary ritual. Instead of coffin tombs, we now have uh, chamber tombs, these are much shallower interments, much wider, and instead of a coffin that separates the body from the rest of the grave, now everything is interred in a shallow, wood-lined uh, chamber. Everything is arrayed together, so the locus of the ritual seems to be now the grave site, rather than the preparation of the corpse and the movement of, this, of the corpse to the grave site. 
elite tombs in this period are much more ostentatious, and the focus is on the quantity of grave goods. Uh, Chinese luxury goods like mirrors decline. We don't see much of them at all. But instead, we have huge amounts of finished iron goods in this tomb. It's Harari. We have the sort of meticulous arrangement of axe blades that the body would have been rested on top of. And towards the end of the Proto Three Kingdoms period, in the third and fourth centuries, chamber tombs do persist, but they become much more regionally distinctive. And in particular, in Gyeongju, we see an interesting mutation. Uh, chamber tombs become much more uh, elongated and slender. And there's a focus on very regular arrangements of axes, or excuse me, of spear blades and um, ceramic sets. And there's also a dichotomy now in ceramics. All these ceramics are still these tile-like wajo vessels, but we have simple storage vessels contrasted now with highly individualized, meticulously produced, um, more decorative uh, platters, dishes, bowls with uh, raised stands, lids, uh, elaborate handles. And they seem to sort of form the core of a feasting or ritual vessel offering component to rituals that a lot of researchers have tried to connect to the uh, Chinese Bronze Age practice of uh, interring or using uh, bronze vessels in mortuary ceremonies. And we don't see any of these objects in non-mortuary contexts. And it seems like the industry that was building up around just the production of specific mortuary ceramics was becoming uh, very prominent, and it was in fact even driving the way this technology developed and changed. So there's a, a great uh, article by an archaeologist, Yi Songju, and he studied the development of these simple globular storage vessels, and he suggests that it was, it was the demand for these objects in tombs rather than anything else that created this, um, this new form that then spread to the rest of society, to habitation sites, to um, production areas. Yeah, the late third and fourth century is also when we see these enigmatic duck-shaped vessels. They only appear in the third and fourth centuries. They only appear in the Gyeongju region, and then they abruptly kind of vanish and disappear. So I feel like I could just talk for a whole hour on duck-shaped pots, but um, uh, maybe next time. And chamber tombs are also arranged more regularly in discrete cemeteries now, often completely disconnected from um, any other kind of village site or any other kind of human occupation. Discrete cemeteries with a very regular, well-planned arrangement. Okay, so that's it for the sketch of the Iron Age, the mortuary material. How has this stuff been interpreted and put into a narrative of Korean history by researchers. Pretty much unfortunately for archeologists, historians got here first. They've had their claws in driving the interpretation of the Iron Age and archeology span still is essentially um, you know, seen as generally a sort of supporting evidence for historical models rather than something that could actually shape or change the way we fundamentally understand the period. And so we have two major texts uh, that cover the Iron Age. The first is the Samguk Sagi. It was written much, much later in the 12th century. And it's a dynastic history of the Shilla Kingdom, long after the Shilla Kingdom itself fell. And it describes in the, from the first century BC to well through the fifth century, sixth century, a very strong centralized kingdom known as Shilla that had uh, a very elaborate government bureaucracy, a military, um, yeah, a very, strong, well-established territorial kingdom, surrounded by other similarly developed kingdoms that were constantly fighting with each other. And if we look at the archaeology, this is really just completely anachronistic. There's no evidence for anything on this scale. Um, and historians do acknowledge this. And although the Samguk Sagi still has a lot of influence, it's sort of fallen out of favor, uh, favor. And what has replaced it has been usage of Chinese historical texts. 
that are much more contemporary with the period. So this account of the Han and the Sangu Zhu was written in the third century. So roughly the same period when these uh, archaeological features were being produced. And the account of the Han describes something called the Sam Han, these three Han groups, Ma Han in the west, Qin Han in the north, and uh, or Qin Han in the east, and then Pyon Han in the south. It's a very short account, so there's not really much we can extrapolate from it. It seems to have been politically decentralized. Uh, there was a loose hierarchy of towns and settlements. A single, a single ruling township would have um, ruled over a number of smaller villages, and these villages themselves would have had satellite townships or even smaller uh, habitation areas. Yeah. So what historians have extrapolated from this is sort of a settlement hierarchy model where we have yeah, capitals surrounded by uh, larger villages, surrounded by uh, smaller um, habitation areas. And this has been mapped onto the archaeology and the cemeteries to suggest that, well, these l the larger and more elite cemeteries must correspond to the ruling townships of the account of the Han, and these smaller cemeteries surrounding them in more isolated river valleys must then correspond to these smaller villages. New evolutionary frameworks, uh, and especially good old element services, band, tri tribe, chiefdom, state, are very prominent in interpretation of these polities. And so generally the, the Han groups and the archaeology are fit into the chiefdom stage. And then in the early Iron Age, we have these chiefdoms that into the proto three kingdoms period formed confederations of chiefdoms. And then these naturally developed into the first states like Shilla, like Pekche, like the Kaya groups. And so, but all of this relies very heavily on mortuary evidence. And so the way these sites are usually understood is in the construction of cemetery and regional site hierarchies. So trying to map this village hierarchy system onto the archaeology, and especially matching named historical polities to specific sites. So if you have a particularly elaborate cemetery, it will be named as the regional authority according to the account of the Han in that particular area. Grave goods, uh, reconstruction of the technological expertise of the region, possible cultural similarities based on the stylistic qualities of artifacts are also used as a way to sort of supplement and fill in the gaps in this very uh, piecemeal or very uh, vague historical narrative. That is generally the place of archaeology. Um, although recently, at least from my perspective, I think the archaeologists are fighting back now that there's, there's so much more archaeology than there is uh, historical documents that it's, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. I don't mean to talk so badly about historians. Some, <laughs> some of my best friends are historians. But, um, yeah, so that is the state of research, I think. I think that's a, a pretty fair assessment of what's going on in Iron Age studies. I think the archaeological evidence actually, though, potentially can be used to sort of question or complicate this narrative and also can speak more generally to um, world archaeological problems, like state formation is state a valid category, how do states come into existence. I think the, uh, the, the mortuary material can really complicate these issues. And the first aspect that I want to sort of zoom in on is looking at transitional tombs. So as I mentioned, in the first and second centuries, there is a transition from coffin tombs to chamber tombs. And this seems to happen throughout the region in this period. It happens everywhere. Um, it's fairly consistent, but, uh, but it is important to note that the, the adoption process of graves was actually quite variable. So in the Gyeongju region in Sarari, we have initially coffin tombs that take on aspects of chamber tombs rather than uh, the full um, replacement of coffin tombs with chamber tombs. So here we have a coffin tomb that is much more uh, shallow and contains aspects of artifact display that would become characteristic of, of chamber tombs. Farther south, we have very, um, we have unique chamber tombs that appear only in this region, very wide, almost square 
chambers with a very random um, arrangement of artifacts within them. And then at other sites in Ulsan, chamber tombs do appear, but they coexist with coffin tombs until well into the fourth century, so long after these coffin tombs were supposedly out of favor or replaced. So this doesn't necessarily contradict the idea that the entirety of Yongnam was at a relatively culturally homogenous chiefdom stage, but it does offer this caveat that there was a high degree of local variation, local autonomy in how and when these tombs were adopted. And a similar pattern emerges when we compare the uniformity of the entire funerary program at various sites. So how exactly can we do this? Well, I started by looking at tombs from the very end of the Iron Age, the third and fourth centuries, when you would expect a fairly uniform ritual to develop if a kingdom like Scylla was consolidating its power, if these regional confederacies were, in fact, becoming more politically linked into what would become Scylla. So some of the most ubiquitous objects we have in this period are very simple storage jars, uh, shallow earthenware bowls, iron blades, swords, ring pommel swords or daggers, and then a wide assortment of iron tools, axes, uh, forks, sickles, plows, things of, th things of, uh, of that nature. <clears throat> so most of these objects appear in consistent spaces within the tomb. Uh, storage jars are usually found at the foot of the corpse in discrete uh, clusters of ceramics. And uh, iron blades are found at the side, at the waist of the corpse. And so at a site with a very codified, a very consistent mortuary ritual, we would find these ubiquitous objects always in the same place. Um, so what I did was I started to look at these cemeteries and the actual arrangement of these objects in tombs at various sites. I sort of created a, a database that recorded the exact location of all these common object types and the uh, different sites at different sites in the region and then applied a statistical measure of um, uh, variation that allows us to compare artifact placement at different sites. Um, I won't go into too much detail into this, but if anyone's familiar with Ian Boris's work in the Mediterranean, he was my starting point, his idea of uh, mortuary variance, looking at how comparing actual mortuary practice to an ideal uniform modal value that would, you could then measure the actual degree of variation from. I applied that to artifact types. So at each site, I can come up with a ubiquitous artifact, and then a measure of how variable it is, and then compare that from site to site. And so I did this for a lot of different sites. I spent a lot of time reading Korean site reports and entering data. It was a very dark period in my life. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to just talk about two sites today, two of the most, the largest and most completely excavated sites, where we have the most abundance of data, Hwang Song Dong and Dok Chon Ni. These sites are located very close to each other in the Gyeongju Plain, within 15 kilometers of each other. They both have a large number of tombs from this final Iron Age period, the slender Gyeongju-style uh, chamber tomb. So you'd think, comparing the uniformity of practice of these sites, that you'd have a fairly consistent ritual, that this is clearly the same culture, these are both sites for communities that are going to be incorporated or are already incorporated into Shilla, into this early kingdom. I did not find much evidence of this. And in fact, at Dr. Ni, for any object type I looked at, the variation was much, well, there was much more uniformity at Dr. Ni than Hwang Song Dong. Everything was much more uh, diverse in terms of placement, in terms of its in use in mortuary ritual at Hwang Song Dong. Uh, so the score you, that is produced from this uh, statistical measure from zero to one uh, site with a score of zero would be completely uniform. A, a site with a score of one would be completely diverse with no uh, consistency. And so Dok Chun Ni has very low scores, whereas Hwang Song Dong has significantly higher scores. <coughs> 
what else do I want to say? Yes, so at doctrinal need, tombs conform to a consistent template. And the only thing that varies, varies is the degree of elaboration. So we do have tombs that would have only one iron spear and a couple of um, um, ceramic vessels, but we also have tombs that have um, a, a small number or a large number of uh, spear blades and then a large number of vessels in this auxiliary chamber. We always find these rows of spears and these sets of later Wajal vessels. It's very, very consistent throughout the cemetery. We can also observe this at a number of other cemeteries in Gyeongju. Uh, and we even see similar tomb elements, like these rows of spears, like these feasting and display ceramic sets. And uh, there's also, I mean, this may be just be my imagination from having stared at these cemeteries for hours and hours and hours and hours, but there's an interesting sort of competitive, almost competitive aspect to the way these arrangements um, um, are created. As time goes on, they just become much more elaborate. So at Dokchon Ni, we have a nice row of iron spears, but at the fourth century site of Kuori, we now have hundreds of spear blades arranged in an almost lattice pattern, a separate chamber for ceramics, and we see this pattern at a number of other sites. So at the very least, the degree of elaboration, the sort of pageantry or the um, amount of expense in funerals, and funerals is becoming much more pronounced over time. But if we go back and look at sites like Hwang Song Dong, despite being very close, um, in fact, Hwang Song Dong is much closer to Dok Chon Ni than is Kuo Ri, or any of these other very elaborate sites. Um, yeah, sites like Hwang Song Dong do not seem to prioritize rituals in the same way, and they do not seem to be engaging in this regional one-upmanship or imitation or consistent uh, practice. Tombs are much more diverse and there's really no coherency or generally agreed upon proper standard for what constitutes a burial. And so a lot of researchers have tried to explain this difference, this observable difference in terms of a political hierarchy, right? So um, the argument goes that the more wealthy and elaborate cemeteries like Dok Ni, like Kuo Ri, are the elite centers, and that Huang Chong Dong must have been a peripheral um, subordinate village or polity or something like that. I mean, this is plausible, but I don't think it's entirely supported by the mortuary evidence. If we look just simply at the wealth of tombs, if we look at simply the amount of iron objects, the amount of ceramics, and then the presence or absence of difficult to procure or produce objects like duck pots, like mirrors, like um, iron horse riding equipment, there's really very little to distinguish Tok Chon Ni and Hwang Song Dong. And in fact, if anything, Hwang Song Dong is more wealthy in terms of what it has in its tombs. So I don't think we can simply say Tok Chon Ni is more elaborate, therefore it is an elite cemetery. I don't think there's any sort of overarching political structure or um, hierarchy that has developed yet. What I think is actually going on is that although mortuary material does point to very strong cultural networks and a shared symbolic language. Um, yeah, we have differing ritual priorities and uh, differing levels of engagement with regional mortuary customs at individual sites. And I think the mortuary data, data is hinting at imitation and uh, excuse me, imitation and competition at a regional scale among certain groups in Gyeongju that, but participation in this seems to have been if not voluntary, then variably expressed. So I think this diversity and this lack of any evidence for an overarching political authority, even in this very late period, just before we have the Shilla Kingdom, it really complicates the state, uh, excuse me, complicates the state formation narrative. Um, how did these states come into existence? It doesn't seem to have been a simple process of chiefdoms gradually coalescing into one coherent uh, political entity. 
Uh, yeah, so there's plenty of other issues that uh, follow on from this sort of assessment. If there was no political coherency, how did these state level societies eventually emerge? What was the role of China in this process? I haven't really talked much about what's going on in Han China. Uh, is it the way some Korean more nationalistically inclined researchers argue that the presence of Han China in the peninsula sort of retarded social development and until it sort of backed off a bit in the um, third century, that's when this explosion of, um, of new mortuary features comes into existence. Yeah, what was, what was China's role in either impeding or facilitating this process? Uh, yeah, is this pattern repeated in neighboring regions in the rest of Korea, in southwestern Japan, or even farther north, closer to where uh, the Han Chinese commanderies actually were? What is the role of geography, access to rivers or mineral resources? Um, yeah, how can recent non-mortuary sites contribute to this developing picture? What's the deal with, with duck butts? Uh, that kind of stuff. So I'm looking at all these questions now, but I think that is where I will stop talking for today. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you have time for some questions. Of course. Again, if anybody has to leave, feel free to do so. Um, if you want to call on your own questioners or... Um, I actually have two. The um, first one, and both of them sort of going back to your, your description um, of, sort of Korean archaeology and sort of the, uh, the background information. One is the administration of all these rescue excavations. Um, just looking at the pictures of excavations and looking at the graphs and knowing a thing or two about history, it looks really similar to the way it's done in Japan uh, for a number of historical reasons. But yeah. I'm curious. Uh, about exactly who is administering and taking responsibility for the rescue excavations. How is that run? That's my first question. Um, you, you asked me a few years ago, I could have told you very simply that there's the central government, the ministry of uh, the CHA, the Cultural Heritage Administration, but then the, the central government in Seoul administers all this, and there's regional government organs that it's a very top down, centralized administration. Of approval of construction projects and then the commissioning of um, yeah, surveys and excavations if necessary, and then, and then a sort of penalty for not finishing these excavations on time in the budget and not publishing the But recently, um, the last two presidents, Park, uh, Ibram Bak and Park and Ed, have sort of complicated and changed things. and so. You may have noticed this, uh, maybe let's go back to it, this sort of ominous mm, drop off. Did. Yeah. <coughs> so, let's continue. Yeah, so this ominous drop off after 2009. Uh, this was not a blip, this is a continuous downward trend as sort of uh, government restrictive regulations prioritize construction, general economic downturn, is all in very I'm actually not quite sure what's going on. Yeah. Well, my other question is about those earliest iron tools that are coming in the, the early iron age. You said it's a bunch of Han finished objects. I'm um, curious, is there any presence of Yan cast iron as well? Yes, we have uh, cast iron axes from about the uh, 3rd, 300 BC. Right there. Um, again, they constitute pretty much the only iron we have for that period. Of yeah. Some there's a few sites with this attached to pottery and very simple crude iron blades. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were engaging in smelting on a very limited scale or they were refashioning cast That's That was going to be my next question is about refashioning because I know we see in, in Japan sort of the reuse, the re-chipping and re-grinding of, of cast metal from the I was wondering if there's a similar phenomenon in um, South Korea. I can check into it for you. I don't want to okay. potentially confuse myself. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it is very similar to Japan. Okay, cool. It happens earlier in Korea, I think. Yeah, certainly. 
Thank you. I have two questions. One is about the feasting um, collection, and that is, I know that you only really have mortuary evidence, but if there is any more evidence to help you answer this question, do you think that those feasting uh, ceramic sets are for the dead, for the living, or for the deities? And my second question is, are there any um, shrines or sacred locations that somehow these cemeteries link to? Meaning, are these dead really for, are they all this accoutrement really for the dead because they were there in the living's life? Or are they for the people who are them or are they for the deities? Um, I think in answer to your first question, it's largely to facilitate the feasting of the mourners, the living at the time of burial. They're not, well, again, we have this, this storage jars and then the feasting and stuff. Right. So feasting seems to be happening at the time of the funeral, and then these objects are interred in the tomb, in addition to a number of other storage vessels containing food and things like that. Them. But again, savage archaeology, lack of money, none, no proper um, analysis of the contents of these jars has taken place. Um, but that's actually a really interesting In answer to your second question, I, we, certainly in later periods, there's a, a very pronounced emphasis on mountain worship and holy uh, important sites on the mountainsides. We don't have any, or at least we haven't recovered anything from the Iron Age in relation to this. Um, yeah, I don't think we have, I think that you could sort of nicely categorize as a, a ritual site or some kind of yeah, important ritual site or something connected to important areas. Like in the landscape, yeah. Like are these oriented towards the place? Or oh, the cemeteries? Well, yeah. these bodies, are they all oriented, yeah. I mean, oh. oriented towards sacred places? In the early Iron Age, they're oriented more along the contours of the, usually a hillside, you're saying that the hillside, and they follow the contour of the hill. Um, when we get chamber tombs, they're more regularly spaced east west. Uh, they're regularly arranged east west in very regular patterns. And uh, this is in contrast to China, where it would be north-south. So, yeah, I don't You're think- You're making a real statement against China, then. Yeah. <laughs> that would pretty- That's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't think they're being oriented in particular to prominent like, natural landscape, or natural landscape, or particular geographic. Yes, I have two questions about the, the data analysis. And the first one is, and this is not a sample, this is not the what's your sample size, but, how many burials did you end up incorporating in your? Um, well, the, the two largest sites, the Frank and Compton Dome, we each have close to 300 tombs each. Yeah. And um, as you can see, a lot of these have hundreds of, of objects yeah. inside them. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, um, in the analysis that I did on uh, 200 burial cemeteries in Central Mexico, um, one of the things I tried not to do was to assume that there was uniformity. So I used, I used regression analyses and cluster analyses to try to see what might be repeated patterns. And one of the things I found in looking at your stuff, it looks like you have something going on here is that there's multiple kinds of actions going on which might, rather than being thought of as a very mortuary program, which is how we've always thought of it, we might think of them as different kinds of rituals, and some of them take place in all the places, and some of them only take place in some of the places, and the cluster analysis and the regression analysis let me see those. Um, so I, I, I actually had not thought of using the, the sort of modal variance approach, and since I'm going back to the data set and doing it again this year, I'll see, you know, I'll be in touch, because you know, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think in, uh, in response to that, I will say that um, I didn't include it here, but I do have a lot of evidence for like just different types of activities, different types of things that are coalescing into this, you know, ossified archaeological feature. Um, 
increasingly ceramics seem to be um, part of the, if within a site, we'll have a nice hierarchy of, um, or at least a different degree of, so there's a ritual set, right. and um, this could be elaborated on in a few different ways, and this was important within a site. So it's important to distinguish with ceramics how much better you are from people in your community. But you. the iron in itself seems to be more incorporated into these more regional communication networks. And so yeah. you're, um, there's these really fascinating iron stock beds that are, you find them everywhere in very elaborate tombs, and they're all roughly similar looking, but each site had its own idiosyncratic way of producing them. Some of them like folded on these you know, really cute things, others actually shaped the iron into this fashion. So it seems like there's a conservative regional communication when it comes to the iron displays in contrast to the ceramics. But yeah, I think you're right that I do think that I can think more about. But that's exactly that's exactly the kind of thing that I was able to pull apart is that some things yeah, actually in the one vi the village I was working in the various are clusters under house floors which made it possible to talk about them in terms of neighborhoods huh. and certain neighborhoods did things and other neighborhoods didn't but then there were things that everybody did and then there were things that were done everywhere but rarely and so I could begin to sort of begin to think of it more in terms of living practices which is another way of getting outside of the historians sort of lockstep on this because they don't care about it, right? So they haven't, they haven't said anything about that. They haven't taken the oxygen out of the room. I have much more work to do. I have a question that leads bit from that. I mean, and you beat a bit down on the way the data is being collected and all these constraints that come from that sort of archaeology. Given that, given that it has been collected that way, there are obviously constraints. How good is the dating, for instance? So do you actually have 300 burials so and you can actually see some sort of my, minor chronology within the artifactual material that you're looking at, or are you going purely by the typology of the, the artifacts? Or That's a real, yeah, it's mainly based on typology and um, relative chronology rather than very um, um, <coughs> nice radio growing samples or other kind of uh, archaeometric techniques. So are they collecting this material so it could be dated, or is it just gone? They are now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's actually, Maybe I'm being a little unfair to the state of the I think since the early 90s, things have really gotten a lot better. And so everything actually, um, since then, we usually have at least a few radio carbon dates from maybe one or two very elaborate tombs or uh, habitation sites. Um, there's been a lot more excavation of entire villages, agricultural fields. It's actually a huge amount of data. I mean, it's, yeah, it's enormous. It might not be done by universities, but it's a huge amount. Yeah, but I think you definitely put your finger on a limitation not just of the data as a whole, but my research, and it's very dependent on these relative chronologies. So I sort of limited this. Can you try to counter that? Yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, so I, I limited myself to looking at similar two types of these slender tubes. I think we can be more confident that they, they appear in really roughly the same time period in different sites. But yeah, that is a real I'm actually going to ask Rosemary as much as you. Um, I'm wondering whether I don't. I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with, and I'm amazed at his work, with Rick Wilkes' work and his idea of a structure of common difference. Yeah. And the whole notion that instead of talking about styles or whatever that there is sort of basically an underlying code within which there are a structured, uh, recognizable, understood differences that are being played out, and whether a concept like that might be applicable. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be, you know, for me, yeah. um, I, I actually developed my framework from the practice theory, so right. I'm, I'm using the standard language of practice theory partly because it works. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that um, something like what, what Rick has been talking about, I mean, any of these are basically saying that the, the things that we see as mortuary deposits right. are the result of a variety of actions which people do under a, a set of assumptions about what correct action is. Right. and you have to multiply the players and the actions and, and then you can account for the stability and the variability. Right. And that's what he's saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
You just have to have a rich data set like you can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think I can have anything of a similar in addition to that. <laughs> I say I'm not as familiar as I should be. Yeah, well, it's actually not. I mean, he has an article in the Journal of Social Archaeology from 2004 or something like that, and then he had something in a, um, another journal in the mid 90s or something like that. And he actually is just deceiving because he actually uses um, contestants in a beauty pageant in Oaxaca as his example. So it's not like something you'd look at and say, oh, this is going to be directly relevant to my work, right? But he lays out this sort of notion of uh, what he prefers to think of as a better way to talk about stylistic variation. Because he's an ethnographer who began his life as an archaeologist, so he's right. like the perfect yeah. creature. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So he, he can he can think both both modes. Right. Yeah. 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 But it is, it's a really good and he's done that also with his work on um, Elysian food waste. Food waste, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And of course, when you go all the way back, he's one of our first people to talk seriously about how we can talk about things like this as potentially indicators of wealth versus other kinds of things. So he's a good person to, for, to engage with in the culture. So. <laughs> So if we do not have anybody else, let's thank Jack for sharing yes. this. Yes. I suspect there are people who are being polite and not wanting to browse you with questions who want to have more conversation. So go right ahead. <laughs> Good. So,